significant help, and I kind of awfully use this quote from our, our founder about that the, the world's getting better, but it's not getting better fast enough, and it's not getting better for everybody. And I think, you know, whether we're talking about health reform in the United States, or whether we're looking across the world, and developed countries, and places that I visit, um, health reform is on everyone's mind, because the way we've currently done health care for the past hundreds of years just doesn't scale. Uh, you know, we might do a reasonable job of taking care of a half a billion people in the world, not seven billion people. <laughs> so the kind of projects, the kind of things that all of you are involved in are the things that I think really uh, offer value to the future moving forward. So I'm going to take us on a little journey today. I'm going to be talking about, first of all, a little about animal health, mobile health, more specifically about games for health, connect and health, which uh, has been an amazing journey for me at Microsoft, and finally just a little bit on the topic of, of innovation. But before I do that, I'm going to start with a little personal story because I'm sure a lot of you are wondering what's this old guy from Microsoft up on stage talking about gaming. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey and, uh, and how I got where I got because there's some history here that makes sense to how uh, what I'm doing today. So this is where I grew up, Big Harbor, Washington, a small little fishing village about 50 miles southwest of Seattle. Delightful place, nice scenery. It rains a lot, just like Boston. <laughs> and this is my family. My mom and dad, I was an only child. Uh, this is me at about age 11. My father was a city fireman. My mother was a school secretary. My parents, neither one of them, in fact, nobody in my family went to college. They were all long line firefighters. Uh, my younger brother on my dad's left. And uh, <laughs> my parents were pretty insistent that I go to college. And not only go to college, but they wanted me to be a professional. They really wanted me to be a dentist. So when I enrolled in pre med uh, in undergraduate school, uh, I decided I better find out something about dentistry. So I we had a neighbor with the dentist and followed him around for the days in his office. And let me tell you, the experience of being a patient and actually being the dentist are entirely different. <laughs> I quickly decided, no way did I want to be a dentist. So I enrolled at the University of Santa Tacoma in pre-med. But a funny thing kind of happened along the way, and this is part of the story. I got involved working on a television station switchboard, answering calls. And there was a TV in the lobby, so I watched lots of TV in my college years. And uh, while I was there, I came up with this. I noticed that there was a bell programming and kids programming, and nothing for teenagers. So I went to station management, being kind of a brash young kid, and I said, I've got this great idea for the show. Let's do a teenage variety show with hot cars and passions and rock stars and all that cool stuff. I will talk about some serious subjects, too. And management said, that's kind of an interesting idea. So all through college, I did this teenage variety show summers and every year it got bigger and bigger and bigger. The next thing I knew I was managing six rock bands and producing outdoor rock concerts and all kinds of crazy stuff. And so when it came time to go to medical school, that sounded kind of boring. <laughs> so I didn't go to medical school. My wife and I, I think, got married. Uh, I then decided being in front of the camera wasn't the safest place to be, so I thought I'd get into management after dabbling in news and a bunch of other things. Moved to Ohio, became an assistant manager of the station there. And very quickly, sort of like the dental thing, very quickly figured out that was not the way I wanted to spend my life. I'd be moving all the time. So I went to medical school. I got into medical school in Ohio. And uh, here, uh, many years later, uh, I am with my wife uh, at graduation. Uh, those of you who have a sense of history will look at that camera and have a rough idea. Uh, that was very cool technology in its day. In fact, I want you to know that uh, my wife just sold that camera for a couple hundred bucks, there's a market out there for it. But anyway, that's, that's me at graduation. Now the reason I tell you this story is the sense of the television background and the medical background, because when I came back to Seattle and joined uh, Virginia Mason Medical Center in, 19, say this, in 1982, um, I was known in the area for doing television, and so the two careers kind of came together. Now, at about the same time as I was finishing my residency and we were moving back to Seattle, there was this computer thing going on. I thought, wow, that's really cool. I was always been kind of interested in machines and stuff, devices. And there was this computer. And so, you know, here I am, this, this starving resident just coming out of training, you know, and I'm convincing my wife to let me go out and buy this, you know, I think it was 1200 bucks or something. And I paid like 300 more for 16 kilobytes of extra memory. You know? Yeah. And I started playing with this thing. And it just blew me away. It was so it was so fun, it was so exciting. I started programming and doing all kinds of interesting things. You know, I grew up on Star Raiders and Missile Command, really cool. 
cool thing, get some antiquated down, but gosh, it's a lot of fun. And then about uh, probably in the late 80s, early 90s, I got my first real computer and spent way too much time on games like this one. Seventh Guest was still one of my favorites of all time and missed. Great games, enjoyed all that. And then, like I told you, the, uh, as I started to practice medicine and I sat with my patients, uh, and I realized what I was really doing all day long was over and over again telling the same stories, really. You know, this is diabetes, this is hypertension, this is this, this is that. And I thought, as a former television guy, that's really kind of painful. What if I could tell those stories not one on one, but one on a hundred thousand, one on a million? Well, you probably can guess where this is going. I got back involved in the television industry. And for 20 years, I combined medicine and media, I worked for ABC News and Lifetime and Discovery and our local stations in Seattle, where this picture is from. And I learned a lot about that. As the internet came along, I saw the internet as yet another way to reach people about health. And so my career kind of moved in that direction. Now, as you might imagine, somebody doing medicine and media, telemedicine became a really interesting area for me. Now, there's nothing new under the sun about telemedicine. Look at this slide from a magazine cover in 1924 and 1925. This was the future as envisioned by people then of telemedicine. They said 50 years hence, so in 1975, this was going to be telemedicine. <coughs> this is before the days of television, really, during the days of radio, but they imagined this apple plate tube and a physician sitting there with the haptic devices that would sense what was going on to so the patient. There's a, there's a nurse or there's a patient and there are haptic devices there probing. You know? So this is what people were thinking about back then. Now, when I came along, certainly during, even before my era, I've always said there's nothing new about telemedicine, so not being real inventive here. Uh, telemedicine, you know, in the 50s and 60s was largely constrained to large academic medical centers. Um, the, the Catholic Church uh, had big telemedicine centers, the military, governments, but the ordinary hospitals and doctors didn't have telemedicine because it was just way too expensive. It was big, bulky, needed satellites and cables and all kinds of crazy stuff. So, as I thought about the internet and thought about where it was going, and as I, on my gaming console at home, I explored suddenly, wow, I can do there was audio on the computer, then there was video on the computer. And I was going like, wow, this is really getting interesting. This is kind of like having a little broadcasting station here, right? You've all probably thought that. And so, in about 1998, 99, 2000, we formed a company called Virtual Clinic Incorporated, doing business with Dr. Goodwell, working with Microsoft and built a telemedicine platform on then available technology that looked like this. It was pretty amazing in its day. We had $13 million in venture capital we were playing with. We thought we were going to take over the world. It was an amazing thing. It worked. It was a little funky, but it worked. And we could actually do telemedicine business. So it was pretty cool. Now, why do I mention this? Well, first of all, what happened? you all to think about this as you think about health, gaming, and all things you're doing. First of all, in our case, the tech bubble burst. We all know about that, the dot-com bomb, right? The technology was too hard to use. We were so far ahead of the market and ourselves and the technology that doing this in the late 90s, early 2000s, video over the web, relying on people who had video, video cameras, who could configure the computer to work with video cameras, being able to tunnel via VPN into large corporate environments because that's kind of where we're working. The technology is just too hard. Consumers weren't ready. I mean, consumers just weren't ready for this. We learned a lot. We learned a lot about how consumers will interact with technology and how the technology, just, once they saw the doctor on the screen, the technology just kind of faded away and when it worked, it was great. And if consumers weren't ready, clinicians definitely weren't ready. They're like, mm -hmm. although we had a business model that would pay them, and when you pay physicians for doing things on the computer, suddenly they really like it. So that's a good thing, right? Um, but the bottom line was the market just was ready for us. Okay, so that's my story. Move forward to today. There are a half a dozen, a dozen companies out there doing what we were doing back in, in the late 90s. Uh, this is America Well, you can put them. Uh, now in the state of Hawaii and other states around the country, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, people can go online and see their doctor or a doctor 
In many cases, uh, this is HMSA, why the insurance carrier there, they will pay for these visits if you're insured by them. That's good territory. And again, because visits are paid for, suddenly the doctors like to do them, right? This is uh, our friend at United Healthcare, that now I think they're also using resources in American Well. You can see there's some states that are operating in. So, you know, it's not going to be that long before no matter where you live, one way or another, you can go online and see your doctor or a doctor. There are things that hold us back still. There are bizarre regulations about practicing over state lines and things that make the business difficult, but this is healthcare, and healthcare is always difficult. Also, I think it's interesting to note that we're now seeing Walmart step in with sort of pod-like uh, clinics. So basically, there's a you know an LPN or, or just a, a Walmart clerk there who hooks you up and you see your doctor somewhere. Uh, one could wonder where this is going. I mean, today if I'm in Boston, I using one of these services, I probably see a doctor someplace in Massachusetts. But with the little tweaking of the regulations, there's no reason why I couldn't be seeing a doctor in Bangalore or some other place in the world. So that's good. And with the technologies we have today, with, with contemporary commodity platforms, here I'm showing some work we're doing with Polycom on our uh, Microsoft Link technology and other platforms that are out there, we can do really robust web presence. We can scale people from messaging to mail to video to web conferencing, you know, any place in the world, anytime, high fidelity, amazing stuff. So, that gives you a background of sort of where telemedicine is and where it's going and how that all comes into play. Now let's move on to some of these other areas that I think are quite interesting. And let's start with AmHealth, because it's all about COVID today, right? All about COVID. AmHealth is everywhere. Um, I saw a statistic the other day that was totally amazing in terms of the number of cell phone accounts around the world. Like more people have cell phones than have uh, electricity and running water. And stuff like that. Crazy. Um, this is just an example when we launched our <coughs> platform. I've done a lot of work with this company, IQ Max. They do a lot of work uh, in uh, professional areas with uh, doctors and so forth, uh, giving clinicians complete access to all of their information in the hospital, in their office, being able to chart uh, basically on a mobile device, being able to dictate on a mobile device. I mean, there's an explosion of stuff going on there. This is actually another example. This shows really telemedicine down the level of the smartphone. This is one technology network. They send community nurses out to take care of people with complex acutus ulcers and other kinds of wounds. They care for them in the home. They save $72,000 per patient, reduce hospitalizations by 95% by taking care of these people in the home. These people go through months of treatment. The nurses are, are connected to satellite control where the wound wound specialists are. It's really amazing, amazing stuff and very cool. And I think if any one of us had one of these wounds, we'd much rather be taken care of at home than in hospital where you're subject to that soup of other stuff that you can get infected with. Uh, here I'm showing uh, again my uh, colleagues and friends from, from uh, United Healthcare and Optum Health. Uh, the idea here is again, you know, the insurance industry working with gamification and working with their members and their consumers and in incentives and exciting ways to get them engaged in health. And United Healthcare has a whole bunch of Optum Healthcare, a whole bunch of uh, different kinds of things around fitness and diet and information. I think is really cool. And then games for health per se. Games for health per se. Uh, even I, as a medical professional, I was a little bit amazed to come across the journal. I mean, when you've got a peer reviewed journal, um, that tells me that this is a pretty established kind of thing. When you've got scientists and researchers in a journal writing about games and gaming, that's a good thing. Again, United Healthcare, uh, I'll let you read it. But basically, they did a survey um, just a few months ago to kind of, I guess, test people's appetite for games and health and what consumers thought about this. And you can see pretty positive feedback. People think this is a really good idea. They want to get engaged. The whole insurance industry, the whole health reform movement is basically putting the emphasis on wellness and, and, and self help and things that people can do. And people certainly see video gaming and gaming as a way to do that. So. This is just one example. Uh, I worked with a, a group of uh, college students in Vancouver, BC, about the time we launched the Windows Phone 7 platform. And they were really <coughs> concerned about childhood obesity. And they saw it around them, even in Canada, it's not just here in America. Uh, and they wanted to do something about it. And so they came up with this game. The game is called Non-Non-Writer. 
But it's this little character, Nom Nom. He kind of runs around. Looks a little bit like Guitar Hero. But uh, in this case, Nom Nom, what you want to do is you want to get the character to eat the good stuff. So if he eats the good stuff and stays away from the fries and sugary drinks and fatty foods and so forth, he stays very thin and fast. If he eats the bad stuff, he slowly gets bigger and bigger and slower and slower and you eventually lose the game. Turns out this is one of the more popular things that have been downloaded on the, on the Windows uh, Live uh, Marketplace. Uh, people love this game. And I think it's just an example of something that actually the students threw together in a fairly short period of time and got it out there on the Marketplace. And, people download it and, and then there's this story. And this is probably one of the more amazing things in my decade at Microsoft that I've seen happen. Uh, it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, you all know about the Connect story, Connect Xbox 360. Um, our, inter our interactive entertainment business, um, you know, they're in the business of making video games, right? And selling millions and millions of video games. And I think even our company was quite taken by surprise by the worldwide interest and the developer, development community that kind of came forward and said, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? And we're still trying to figure out how to deal with all that. Uh, these were statistics just released last week at E3, which is why I can share them. Uh, Xbox is the largest selling council now, 67 million of them, 19 million Kinect sensors, 40 million Xbox Live accounts. So think about it, that's 40 million people who are on a platform or on a network, basically, that opens up some really interesting opportunities for us. Now, when Xbox and Kinect were launched, and Kinect in particular, um, I saw what I would expect to see. In fact, if I went over and talked to our IEB group, they would say, we're interested in selling millions and millions of games. Don't talk to me about health, don't talk to us about health. We're interested in selling millions and millions of games. So what did you first see? Well, you saw these kinds of games coming forward and indeed selling millions and millions of games. But the market kind of shifted and rose up and people started thinking about this and started getting creative. Uh, people like me in the company and people from around the world started interacting with our group IDB and started telling them, well, you know, this thing could do more than just video games. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting. And in some of these areas, what I call the vanity areas, uh, weight loss, dieting, fitness, sex, whatever, you can sell millions and millions of units in those areas. So you're starting to see the, you know, the developers rise up and create all kinds of games. There's even a debug chakra know, transcendental meditation kind of thing available now. So that's going on. At E3, we announced some of the alliances and partnerships we are now doing with some of the big players. Uh, there's something called Nike Plus, and there's a game coming out uh, in uh, December time frame that works with the Nike Fuel Band. It's called Nike Plus Connect Training, where basically you will be able to enjoy a virtualized uh, avatar trainer who will guide you on the Connect and train you depending on the kinds of goals that you want to meet. So I think that's going to be very exciting and very interesting. And then what we're seeing too is that, uh, you know, again, the you know, commercial insurers, the payers in America, looking at health reform, looking at where things are going, looking at accountable care organizations, wellness, uh, being paid for value, these kinds of things, uh, they're kind of rising up too and thinking, well, how do we use games and gaming and create incentives and so here's just one example of what's going on where you know, people are taking in this case kind of an off-the-shelf game and kind of putting their own spin on it and creating incentives around it. So that's how you create monetization of these things and that's something all of you would want to think about. And then finally let's just talk about what's coming and let's talk about innovation because this is kind of the really fun part. Um, actually what happens in my job is I get invited over to Microsoft Research and so I get to see a lot of stuff. And a lot of times they will approach me and they'll say, look at what we're doing, look at this, and tell us, do you see any way this could play out in health and healthcare? And so, of course, what I first saw connect, like a lot of other people, I said, well, let's see now, we have this 3D camera, it can recognize you, it can follow your body movements, it can teach you to dance, it has this amazing array microphone that is very accurate for speech recognition. Uh, it's a platform that can do sort of telepresence in the homes, telegroups. Uh, it can do some other things I'll talk about in a moment. Gosh, if it could do all of that, I can get to help people play games and so forth, but wow, could it help people in 
physical medicine rehabilitation? Could we form virtual communities and groups to do chronic disease management, patient education, right? So all these things are going through, not only my head, but just trust me, every clinician, every scientist, every researcher, probably many of you in this room, around the world is going on when they saw this. So what happened? Well, first of all, we are entering what I think is probably one of the most innovative times. Maybe I shouldn't say this, but maybe everybody thinks the era they're in is innovative. But I see in the pipeline of what's coming, not only from our company, but just in general <laughs> industry, amazing new technologies, the new, amazing new ways that we will interact with our computers. Um, you know, we launched Surface One several years ago and now Surface Two, so we now have this rich multi-touch environment. We have devices that basically can be programmed to recognize things that hover over it or place on it. And so we're starting to see lots of scenarios for surface computing in medicine. Um, entire rooms are becoming surface areas where everything comes alive and everything becomes sort of a mashup of virtual and real. And you've probably seen some of these things on our own website with the Microsoft Research. And then the most amazing thing I think about Connect has been not just the Connect for Xbox, but now the SDK of the release of Connect for Windows, because we're seeing so much development on that platform as well. This is the website for Connect for Windows. If you haven't visited it, I would encourage you to take a look, because it is there that you can avail yourself of all the things that are available to developers on that site. Uh, we've launched the uh, version 1.5 of the SDK, which is the second release in under four months. Uh, we've added near mode, you know, Connect, of course, for Xbox, you want to be kind of across the room. Connect for Windows, you want to be a little closer to the screen, and the device has been adjusted so it does that. Uh, seated mode, skeletal tracking, 11 new languages for speech recognition, SDK for face tracking, uh, and also a TAP program that we uh, have launched uh, 350 companies, including Fortune 50 companies, early access to the SDK bits, access to special forms, extra support from the team. So there's a lot of stuff on that site you should avail yourself of. We also actually launched a Connect Accelerator for Xbox, and at the end of this month, it's going to be my pleasure to sit uh, among the, the judges and mentors of the 11 companies. There were 500 applications from all over the world. 11 companies were selected. I think four of those 11 companies are doing things that are related to health and healthcare. So again, that shows you the worldwide demand. In fact, I've met with some of the people in our IED group who follow uh, interest in Connect and kind of what's going on around the world. They have a bubble chart uh, on the wall, and uh, you, know, you can look at other industries, you know, retail and uh, finance and government, and there's these little bubbles, and then you see healthcare is about like this, and that's because of the inbound interest in energy uh, for devices and technology in that field. So, you know, again, our IED group, Microsoft, created Connect for originally video games. Millions and millions of video games. But what happened? Developers, like many of you in the room, come up, points forward, and say, Well, have you thought about this? And so now we have companies. This is Gesture from Toronto, Canada, one of the people involved in the accelerator program. You know, I've worked in hospitals, I've done patient care, I've done some surgery. Uh, you know, now you need to get at your information, but you're scrubbed in, you're sterile. How do you do that? You're walking around the hospital, you're doing a bone marrow, you're doing some other procedure in your glove, and you need to get at your information on that big screen. How do you do it? Well, people are looking at Connect, and in fact, I can tell you, in a lot of countries around the world where things are less regulated than they are here, people are actually doing this today, and on a fairly large scale, so it's really been amazing. This is sort of the other side, looking at it from inside, kind of, this is actually uh, our, one of our health solutions groups, uh, imaging solutions, that's now part of GE, and, and uh, Paradigm. Basically, they built a hands-free interface using Connect to their imaging solutions. If you've ever been in a shopping mall and watched kids in one of our Microsoft stores or other stores walk up to the Connect, little free rules. What do you see? Like in two seconds, they know what to do. They start jumping around and figure out. It's absolutely amazing. But we're also finding that children who have learning disabilities, ADHD, hyperactivity, et cetera. And this is actually some work with the Lakeside Autism Center, which is in Redmond here in Microsoft campus. Uh, 
they've been playing with this and they've discovered that wow, this just is opening up these kids. Suddenly they're becoming, they're not only interacting with the what's going on on the screen, they can actually start interacting with more with the kids around them. So that's really cool. And if kids love it, well, let me tell you, it's not just for kids, it's even for old people like me. Um, basically in senior centers, what we're seeing is we did a big pilot in Los Angeles with a couple of senior centers in the city of Los Angeles. And uh, you know, basically, these seniors are starting to play the Connect games, kind of the out-of-the-box games, but they're competing with other senior centers. And although this is anecdotal and self-reporting at this point, and we, we, we also, uh, they're using devices that look health fault so they can maintain the record and all that. What was interesting was the participants in this were saying, wow, they're feeling happier, they're enjoying life more, they're feeling more empowered. You know, anecdotally, again, we started seeing improvements in blood pressure, or blood sugar, and ambulation, and people who have been not doing so well, doing much better. We've expanded this now to about 15 more senior centers around the country, and we'll be, I'm sure it'll be more scientific uh, study going on in this area. But I think that's really interesting. I mentioned that, you know, again, meeting with the research folks and the Connect team, um, you know, they throw out ideas. I mean, a couple of, uh, well, actually it was last October, <coughs> Uh, Craig Mundy, who's our chief technology officer and runs Microsoft Research and several other divisions and company, his group came to me and said, we're launching something new that Connect does. Let us tell you about it. I said, okay, I'm listening. Well, the user will now be able to create this avatar of themselves, and they'll be able to project that avatar into these virtual environments. And they'll be able to meet like a tailgate parties and, and uh, uh, watching movies or sporting events, and they'll have these virtual groups, and as they sit in their living room, they'll be gesturing and talking, and their friends and family and friends all over the world will be in this virtual group as their avatars, so everybody will see everybody, and it's really cool. What do you think? I said, hmm. So I worked with the team, and they actually came up with what I'm about, I'm not about to show you, I'll show you up. This simply shows you the generic Avatar Connect, probably some of you have seen this kind of video on the web. But this is what it does. But again, people like me, people like you, people in the scientific community, they look at this. So here I have this platform with millions of people connected to it. I can create an avatar of myself. I can go into a virtual environment and have a meeting, if you will. Well, could this be one day a platform for facilitated group meetings around anxiety, depression, weight management, uh, diabetes, being their favorite chronic disease or chronic condition? Yes, I think it could. And particularly, I think it could because particularly in areas like mental health, people want to protect their anonymity. They don't necessarily want to drive somewhere for these counseling sessions. But could it all happen in a virtual environment with an avatar? Now, I want to be very clear about this because this is stuff that Microsoft will never do. But that's really good news for all of you. So, don't expect to see Dr. Bill running diabetes counseling or depression counseling on the Xbox One system anytime soon. Not going to happen. I can't even promise you for sure that any of what I just said will happen. But I can tell you that on a platform level, these are capabilities of that platform. And as I see our company opening it up for video streaming on Netflix and video streaming on other things and other kinds of things you can connect to, I can envision the day when there could be a services tile on that screen, <coughs> both in Windows and Xbox and apps and so forth, that would connect you with, connect to a doctor, connect to a plumber, connect to a baker, connect to a, right? You can see that the possibility is there. We made a, many of you have seen this, probably a future vision video made about seven years ago. I was deeply involved in this project. And at the time, people looked at it and said, so futuristic. It's just like so amazing. Like that's just so far out there. And I will tell you what we were envisioning seven or eight years ago as we put this thing together. I can look at it and say 95% of what we were talking about then has come to be. So we've been pretty accurate in our descriptions and our research of where technology is going and what technology will look like in the future. We're not quite there yet, but we're almost this idea in the living room, the big screen, the big panel, the devices, the exercise things. If you watch the video, just go on YouTube and look for Microsoft Intervision video, it's all over the place. But you'll get the idea. Now I mentioned that when we launched Connect, that it was all about video games and millions and millions of video games. And to this day, even me inside the company, I have 
a little trouble engaging with that team over there, rightfully so, because their mission is to sell millions and millions of video games. But what happened when we launched Connect is all of a sudden the world started telling us. And I want to share this video so I can capture it better than I can say it. <laughs> Starting with a sense that turned voice and movement into magic. Xbox, but we thought this would be fun to play with, and it was. But something amazing is happening. The world is starting to imagine things we hadn't even thought of. So, I hope I've captured 
in your imagination a little bit before I close out here. Since I started with a personal story, I'm going to end with a personal story. As you might imagine, I mentioned I travel all over the world and I do lots of conferences. And usually when I stumble off the airplane, you know, particularly when I'm in Europe or Asia or some other place in the world, I'm pretty tired. And so I make it a point of getting out, walking around in sunlight or even in rain, uh, simply to adjust to the time zone. Last summer I was in uh, Orlando at a big conference and got there late, at, uh, late in the afternoon and uh, got outside the hotel, walked around the grounds, got really inspired. It was a beautiful day. There was this beach, there were sailboats, people were you know, on the beach, and there's just lots going on. And I always pack my swim trunk because you just never know. And so as I continued to examine this, I thought, you know, I got my big keynote tomorrow. It'd be really cool. Go up to my room, put on the trunks, and go take a swim. Late. So I'm walking back to the hotel, and just as I get to the hotel door, I see this sign. <laughs> <laughs> well, although I didn't go swimming that day, frankly, I guess I didn't allow it. As I stayed at that, that hotel for a couple of days, I noticed there were a lot of ducks on the lake. And I figured, you know, I don't think there'd be a lot of ducks on that lake if there really were very many, if any, alligators on the lake. The reason I tell you this story is as I alluded to earlier, healthcare is hard. There's nothing easy about healthcare. I get a lot of entrepreneurs and other people calling me up. I get doctors calling me up. Bill, I've just invented the world's next best EMR. And I'm like, please, there are 600,000 of them out there. I'm not sure we need another EMR. However, healthcare is hard. It's highly regulated. Everything in the industry is different. I mean, if I was a gamer, I mean, there's probably a lot of areas I focus on before healthcare. But thankfully, it's the right thing to do. And what I, my point here is a lot of times you can look at the industry, you can look what's going on, and all you see is the, what you think are the alligators in the lake that prevent you from moving forward. So forget about the alligators. Do good work. You'll probably find that the alligators aren't as bad as you think they are. Just go forward, develop, innovate. That's what it's all about. Thank you very much. As I said, um, on the schedule you'll find that there's a Q&A session um, with Bill um, shortly. You know, so what do you do if you throw in a conference for like over 400 people and it's a week out? Go to E3. So that's what I did. Um, Okay, so uh, E3 is the industry's largest expo. It, it's where you go to see everything that's new to get some sort of perspective on where things are going next. If you haven't been to E3, um, I suggest you go at least once in your life. Um, usually when I've taken um, people there who come from the sort of health world or the foundation world, their eyes immediately pop out of their head the second they enter the room. Um, this is just a, these are all photos I took this week uh, while I was there. So you can see like Activision's booth, Ubisoft's booth. Okay, so Activision's booth, that screen that says Activision was about as big as this whole room. 
I mean, these booths, they probably, I mean, we're talking more, more budget on their booth than you probably have in your entire game. Um, but it's amazing in that sense. And they have, like, Microsoft brings in a full replica of the Halo Warthog. Um, you know, there's like a Lamborghini in the, in the, uh, in the booth for um, Namco. Um, this is just a sense of the size of the booth. This is like one, one quadrant of the Microsoft booth. They also bring kind of cool artifacts, like Disney brought a lot of cool things from um, uh, Oswald, the character that there is going to be in the next Epic Mickey, so you can check that out if you're sort of a Disney geek. You also get to see a lot of new games, um, and, you know, in this case, like Wii U. Um, this is Scribble Knots, an amazing game. If you haven't played it, I really recommend checking it out. It's on iPad, it's on DS, um, uh, Wii, Xbox, maybe. You also get to go behind the scenes. If you get a chance, you get to go into special private screening rooms and see games that aren't even finished yet. This is Ron Gilbert, who made Monkey Island. Um, it's showing myself, uh, and that's, uh, Man Without the Hair, for many of you who might know him, is Noah Alstein, so Noah took me to see the cave. Really neat game coming out, so sometimes you get these behind the scenes looks. The ESA, which actually produces E3, hosted a luncheon um, with a number of people from around the country who are working on games and learning, other areas like healthcare, um, to discuss ideas. This is Michael Gallagher of Beats, um, the ESA, um, welcoming, welcoming us all to lunch, and we had a whole brainstorm about how we could forge tighter relations with industry, industry resources, uh, and what's going on elsewhere. But of course, I was there for help, at least partly, right? Like I play games too. Um, and you know, you gotta, you gotta look around for the help um, a little bit. You know, you gotta also stop to look around at everything else. Um, and you know, you can find it, if you look for it, you can find other kind of cool things. It's just like a whole slew of games about French history for the Nintendo DS uh, and PC. Um, but you know, if you start walking around a little bit more, you can see like the new version of Zumba, Fitness Core coming out for um, Wii and Kinect um, from Ingesco. Um, you can also see people checking out the latest movement games, like the skiing game for um, PlayStation 3. Um, I really liked uh, the Kinect Avengers game. Um, you could really you could switch on the fly between different characters in the Avengers, and, and then you have to start doing different gestures things like you could be the Hulk or um, uh, Iron Man and other things, this guy would have a lot of fun. I think he wanted to be the Hulk mostly. Um, I wish I had the video, but I got this guy um, at Dan Central, um, Dan Central 3, so it's really funny to watch um, different people trying out the games. Um, at being a, quite an experienced E3 person, knowing how many cameras are there, I'm very good not to do that. Uh, of course, it was Connect Training. Uh, and uh, I have a special photo for you later, Bill, about this that I will not uh, put up on the screen for you today. Uh, you can also check out uh, I did go. Oops. Uh, can't put this screen um, through it, but what it is, it's, it's a huge game um, for the new We Fit You. Uh, and you can see this is also an example of why you don't put, you know, Realize cameras are everywhere in the group. You can see it starts out. The, the new Fit has a lot of kind of weird games. I mean, they're, they're experimenting more with this. And I'm sort of questioning where the thing is here uh, a little bit, but we'll get going in a second. There it is. Now you can see he's going down there. It's getting his momentum up. I guess maybe this is core, core exercise, right? Then, uh, now here it goes, here it goes, there. Now, now he's gonna lean back. Lean back, lean back, lean back, lean back. Lean back. <laughs> I don't know that guy. <laughs> Might be hearing from him. Um, I didn't get a good video of this, but this is kind of really one of the more interesting things I saw. Majesco, a company out of Nova Scotia, pitched to Majesco. They showed them that they could track objects um, with the Kinect. They actually tracked a basketball. And this is an NBA baller game where you, where you basically practice your dribbling skills. They had Darren Williams, um, I think Deron Williams from the Nets was there. And that's why there was this cage, because everybody would have run up to get his autograph. But you could actually practice it. And I thought it was really cool. And I remember bumping into a friend. I was like, that was one of the cooler things he said. Yeah, unless the guy's in the apartment above you. 
Um, of course, uh, Ubisoft had Just Dance 4, we'll see Just Dance 3 today. Um, they have whole dance teams that come out in their, in, in their booth. Um, this was a, a really big product. And then, of course, now you see them pushing out a Just Dance Disney edition, um, so for younger kids. Uh, we'll see Dance Dance Revolution Classroom Edition later today. This is Konami's booth. They were showing a video of it. Uh, we've been there, but you know, not, not, you don't have kids at E3, so you didn't see kids playing the game um, at E3, but you will see them at Games for Help. But, the, you know, the question becomes like, what was, what was new and really exciting beyond that? What, what were a few takeaways? Uh, I really like what um, Xbox is doing with Smart Glass. If you haven't seen this, it's basically Microsoft um, is a, a, enabling an ability for your Windows phone, your iPhone, your Android phone, your tablets to be a secondary screen to Xbox applications and games. Um, sort of kind of like what Wii U is doing, but without having to buy a whole new Wii U. Um, so kind of interesting. Uh, I think this is just kind of getting started. We're just starting to see tech demos. Um, but I, I expect just like what we saw with Connect next year's video, um, you know, what you told us about smart cars. Uh, Sony is doing this really interesting um, thing with their Sony Move platform with books, digital books that come alive. The first one is with J.K. Rowling. Um, and, and this thing, I did not get to go and see this or see it at the press conference, but everybody I was talking to, all the Twitter stream out of it was just like, this was really cool, so definitely go track that down. Um, over in the corner of E3 was a company that had made a Bluetooth dock, and so you could actually have these like kind of cool board games um, with this electronic dice um, on uh, your iPad or, or other tablets, and this, this was kind of exciting. But like, where, you, where was the real innovation even further was in the Indiecade booth. And it, uh, so there was things like Sound Shapes, Prom Week, uh, A Mother's Inferno, um, uh, A Hate Story, um, this weird controller that reminded me of Game Chair from last year. Um, and then of course, uh, Johan Sebastian Joust, if you haven't seen this, you'll see this this evening. Um, a really kind of interesting active movement game uh, that we'll get, all get a chance to play and laugh about today. Uh, so, but what I would tell you is, is what was interesting about E3 wasn't just what was in the room, but what wasn't there. So, of course, um, a lot, Indicate was just an outpost of what we're seeing. The <laughs> amount of an incredible innovation going on outside the confines of what we would consider the core mainstream industry um, that's represented at E3 um, is really truly amazing as you look around. You can almost find a lot more things to be interesting in, the, in an afternoon, um, surfing around on the internet, looking at what people are doing on their own than what you're just seeing at E3. Uh, and it's, it's and, and as well as at conferences like this, at GLS, which is also this week, Games for Change next week, there's a whole, it used to be you didn't really think too much about what was not showing up at E3, and now increasingly I find myself thinking about what's not showing up at E3. And I think that's the sort of big sea change that's gone on industry-wide. Um, and so I would just sort of point out um, that while you want to get to E3, um, it's, the industry has is, is outgrown itself. Um, uh, many of you representing this room are part of that. Um, so now let me, um, let me go to the next part, which is we're going to um, bring up Kristen Lindsay from Child's Play. Uh, and what we're going to be talking about, um, as I introduce her, is we have a lot of sort of audience participation things that we've sort of planned for you. Uh, and one of them, if you got in your pocket in the handouts on, the sh on, on your um, chair, was an Ask the Experts thing. So I've posted notes outside, I have boards in both Skyline and outside. If you've got a question on anything in the game trial space, not just a session, anything, we've got some topic areas. Write it down on the, one of the post-its so we'll have it registration and stick it up on the board in the category. And then Beth and I are going to take these down. We're going to go track down the person that we know is probably the best expert or two here about that. We're going to get those answers. And what we want to do is start collecting a lot of the fundamental questions that maybe the conference isn't well designed to answer. Another thing that we're going to be doing um, is our game RX, our prescription pad, which is a sort of thought process, uh, a, a sort of thought piece that we launched last year where you can envision yourself as a doctor or a health professional prescribing a game. It can either be a game that was built 
now or a game you can imagine in the future. And so all of those were handed out to you. We have more of those outside. And if you go to game-rx.gamesforhealth.org, you can actually fill out an online version of it. As we collect these both here and throughout the year, we're going to be publishing the best ones up online on our website. Um, and then at Sensor Day, we're also going to be asking you to brainstorm new ideas for sensor games. And then tomorrow um, at the um, Sensory Motor Rehab Day, um, Judy Deutsch from UMDMJ is going to be looking at some new ways to sort of categorize and understand what is going on in um, off-the-shelf games or other types of custom games in their application to Sensory Motor Rehab. But one of the other things that we wanted to do is we've been talking to our friends at Child's Play Charity, which is run by Penny Arcade. If you haven't been to pennyarcade.com, Penny Arcade Expo, um, this is really gamers being gamers. But as part of it, um, Dave and Tycho, the, the creators behind um, Penny Arcade, launched the Child's Play Charity, which um, Kristen will talk about. And this is gamers participating with their dollars and their, and their interest in helping improve, helping provide um, support to hospitals and other therapeutic centers around the, around the world. Um, they raised a tremendous amount of money then, and a tremendous amount of equipment. And what we wanted to do is sort of pull upon you to think about what else could they be doing to affect health and healthcare beyond what they're doing now. So I'm going to invite Kristen to tell you a little bit more about that. And then you all got challenge sheets in your, uh, on your chairs, and we would love for your suggestions. So I'll bring Kristen up. 